Well, good morning, everyone in the Department of Surgery. It's my distinct honor uh, to uh, introduce our uh, speaker for the uh, 16th annual uh, David Heimbach uh, lectureship. This lectureship was uh, created by Dr. Gibran to honor uh, Dr. Heimbach's legacy. And uh, as the current steward of the uh, Burn Center, I'd like to share one of his uh, um, many le legacies uh, uh, this morning is, is uh, uh, the, the fellowship. And the fellowship is uh, one of the gems of the Burn Center. Uh, it's something that uh, uh, many of us have gone through. And uh, Dr. Heimbach created that in the 80s, and it's been continuously filled for now almost 40 years. Um, our speaker this morning actually uh, did the uh, Clinical Burn Fellowship in 1988. 89, so uh, or 32 years ago, is that right, Dr. Greenhall? Uh, so Dr. Greenhall is the chief of uh, burns and a professor of surgery at uh, UC Davis. Um, he is a, uh, one of the most accomplished people in the burn world at this point. He's uh, past president of the American Burn Association, uh, current president of the uh, Inter International Society of Burn Injuries. Uh, he's been funded for many, many years through the NIH, the Shriners, and the DOD. Uh, his CV is too long to share. It's got 57 pages, but uh, 285 peer uh, review publications. And, you know, among many of his impacts, I would say the impact that uh, is most resonates to me is what he's done to my career. You know, I applied to general surgery and went to UC Davis to uh, become a surgical oncology person. And I met him as an intern. And I said, uh, Dr. Greenhall, why are we doing this? And he's, he looked at me and said, I don't know. Let's go ahead and study it. Uh, and that really inspired me to kind of um, uh, change my career uh, track. I uh, spent a couple of years in his lab um, and helped me understand that in a relatively young field, we can make a contribution in Burns. And so, so thank you, Dr. Greenhall, for, um, you know, giving me this, um, these ideas um, that I still maintain. Um, and so without further ado, Dr. Greenhall. Hey, thank you, Tom. Let's see. Do you see my screen? Yes, and you can go ahead and put them on a uh, slide projector. There we go. All right. Well, thank you for the invitation. Um, <clears throat> today I'm going to talk about some burn care hurdles basically guided by Dr. Heimbach. And I have nothing to disclose except I have two Department of Defense grants that really look at burn resuscitation, so they're not related to this presentation. And it is a great honor to be the Heimbach lecturer. Um, it's great to pay tribute to a great man. Um, he not only uh, invited me to be a clinical fellow, but he also invited me to do research with uh, Russell Ross, who's a very famous person who discovered platelet derived growth factor. And, then I was a fellow, as Tom said, from 1988 to 1989, and he even sent, signed his picture back then. Um, when I was asked to come out to Sacramento, he was really the only person to support me. Um, and I remember driving with Dr. Heimbach one day, he said, well, what do you think? Should I go out there? And he had a very wise advice. He said, if it flies, Dave, it's your baby. And if it fails, it's your baby. So basically he said, it's up to me. And might as well give it a go, and I was very fortunate to be someone to start a burn unit from scratch at Shriners. And I also marketed my program based on his philosophy, which was, if you do a better job than everyone else, then you'll be very successful. You know, it is fun to travel around the world with Dr. Heimbox, David Herndon, some two great burn doctors, here we are in Korea. And he also had some quotes that stuck with me for years and years, and one was uh, rule number one, all bleeding stops, and Heimbach's corollary was, don't panic, it's not your own blood, which is good advice. He also was a great uh, person for funny sayings like this one, people who exercise do not live longer, it just feels like it. It's also, I have good friends from Seattle, Ron Mayer I've known for many years. Nicole and Frank have been great friends for many, many years. Uh, we've had a lot of talks Richard Carrower was uh, actually pregnant at the same time my wife was when we were fellows, so we've got a long relationship. And as Dr. Pham said, uh, he was a resident with us, and then he worked in my lab for two years, did some great basic science, and 
I believe he wrote 10 papers at that time. So it was great to have Tom and know Tom as he's extended his career. So this is my, my two burn units, the Shriners Hospital here and UC Davis Hospital here and the burn unit for the adults is here. And we, we have uh, basically two burn programs, but they're combined as one. And it's very simple, UC Davis uh, takes all adults greater than 18. And this year we're gonna be probably up around 500 to 550 admissions and Shriners, we just take children. Um, we're probably gonna be close to 260 admissions this year and we do a lot of burn reconstruction. And I have to say, we really had no slowdown for COVID-19 and I'll show you some of the numbers in a minute. Now, our local region is on, in California, we cover a huge area, just kind of like you do up in Seattle. Um, all of Northern California, we push into the Bay Area and uh, we also at Shriners cover all of Western United States. Now. Uh, we haven't penetrated the market for Seattle as much, but uh, we certainly do cover a lot of Western uh, United States. We have a kid from South Dakota actually right now, and we cover the four Western states of uh, Mexico. So one problem we've had, and you have had some extent up in Washington is wildfires. It's a huge problem for us also in Australia and it made it in nature a year or so ago. And it's hard to believe, but uh, on the average, California has about over 8,000 fires per year, and that number is increasing. You can see as of November 18th in 2020, we had over 9,000 wildfires, and, and the amount that is burned is incredible. On the average, about 750,000, but it's increased over the last several years, and in 2020, as of October 23rd, it was over Four and a, almost four and a half million acres. And it seems over the last several years, we've had more deaths, more patients come to the burn unit. And you can see on the right, this summer we had the five of the six largest fires ever in California. So that's been a problem for us. And it blows my mind in that uh, greater than 4% of the California's land um, was burned this year. And what's the cause? We don't know. Is it climate change? Um, as I said, we've gotten busier and busier. And it's a personal thing because this is a picture out my backyard. I live in the farmlands of uh, Central Valley of California. And that's a picture from my backyard. And this is a picture I took when I was uh, one evening. And that looks close. It's only about 35 miles away. It's pretty scary. And the next morning in Davis, California, that's what we're seeing. So. You never know what's going to happen. I have a place in the mountains and you never know if that's going to be wiped out. Neighborhoods are being wiped out. So we've had killer fires lately. Um, usually we don't, fires don't, these fires don't kill people because people are smart. Um, they are told to evacuate and if they're smart, they leave. Um, the people who die are those who stay back in the house. But the deadly ones uh, occur very rapidly. The Tubbs fire, for instance, uh, Santa Rosa, town of 175,000, people went to bed around 11 o'clock and it's 60 mile an hour winds and within a half hour, great part of the town was burned down. So people were trapped and uh, found the next day. And for the Paradise Fire, the campfire, the exit was blocked. So people had to run through the fire. So we, we've had about 10 to 15 admissions every summer, last three summers. And I deal with major burns. Uh, this is what we had this summer, and we've had more of it. You can see that we've had massive burns this year, and more than ever. At one time in September, we had an average burn size of our 12-bed ICU of 60%. So and our mean overall burn size is 11.3%. But the real challenge, and what Dr. Heimbach preached when he came and gave grand rounds to us about 18 years ago was that uh, the greatest improvement in care of burns has been through management of the wounds. Right now we're doing quite well. The LA50 for an 85% upstart for a teenager is about 85% burn. That means half of the kids with 85% burns in the Burn Center will survive and we're doing much better with the elderly. When I was a fellow, a 65 year old with 60% burns, we would just let them go. But now we're 
starting to get some of these people through. So the focus should be how to optimize the functional outcomes and really get people back to society. So I want to talk to you about how you can optimize the function and the appearance of burns and talk about the future and some of the strategies for major burns. Now I have to start with a sad statement. Uh, burn scars are considered evil in our society. And I've had more than one or two kids tell me that, uh, hey, I don't want to look like Freddy Krueger. And they don't want to be murderers. And if you think about it, here are some burn survivors in our movies. Peyton Westlake and Star and Darkman, Cropsey and the Burning. And actually on the right, it's a real burn patient. That picture I, one of my colleagues sent to me from Mexico. So the scars can be horrible. And the Phoenix Society for Burn Survivors in 2018 did a little uh, study where they looked at 32 films of burn survivors between 1933 and 2017. And what they found was these burn survivors almost always isolated. Only five of them had friends. And, you know, half of them were good before the injury. Then they became evil because they came burned. And there really were no happy endings. And four had only hopeful endings. And if you look at the statistics that they evaluated, more than two-thirds were ashamed of their scars. Very few had friends. Almost two-thirds were out for revenge. And most of them hid their scars, which is not what survivors should be doing and uh, revealing their scars was the plot point oh my god the crisis and then uh, most of them end up dying in the end and if you could see that 62 and a half percent were villains and then 15 and a half were vigilantes so that's a big problem people associate scarring with being evil so my challenge is to do a better job than they have done in the movies you know we need to optimize healing which is not only physical, it's mental and social. Because my goal is to get them back to society, become happy people. So it's a it's a tough job. Now I'll start with two definitions. Now people talk about cosmetic surgery. Cosmetic surgery is just making normal tissue more normal. So a facelift, for instance, take normal skin, you make it tighter. Or reconstructive surgery is what we do is we take damaged tissue and try to make it appear more normal. So I have some philosophies. Uh, my first one is do it right the first time. People might say, oh, let it scar and we'll try to deal with it later, but I don't think that's a good strategy. I think you start off, get them to the OR, graft areas that need grafting earlier, and then uh, get them back to school or back to work earlier. The other thing is that all scars are permanent. People don't realize it. So get rid of the scar, you can't get rid of them. We can make them look better, but we can't eliminate scars. So this is a child sent to me from Nevada. He had 80% burns, but they had ignored his hands. And you can see he's got boutonniere deformity, severe scarring. And if you give the body enough time, they'll try to heal all wounds. As opposed to putting on a graft immediately. This is an old picture. I'll show more. You can make them look much better. And what you really need to know is if it heals within two weeks, there's minimal scarring. This was published in 1983 by Ed Deutsch that more than two to three weeks, your chances of hypertrophic scarring go up significantly. Why we're not sure that'd be an area for active research. So I'll give you some examples. This is a young girl spilled a little tea on her lap and there's one little area here that hasn't healed around two weeks. That one area became hypertrophic. The classic scald burn, you have a little child with a spill, a couple areas aren't healed after, oh, about two, three weeks. Those areas start to get thick, and you can see another child. The difference between a flat wound and a hypertrophic scar is only a matter of a few days. And I even cut this out and closed it primarily. It was beautiful, and, but the scar recurred. So if people could figure out what are the signals at around two to three weeks that increase collagen formation, that'd be a great accomplishment. Well, we tend to show our good pictures, but how you turn out also depends what you start with. So very deep burns are harder to deal with. If you have massive burns, you don't have much in the way of donor sites. You don't have much to work with, so you do your best. So the other things are important. Were there other injuries in the state of the patient? Older people tend to do worse. There's Genetic makeup's important. We know some people, 
scar no matter what you do to them. And we don't know why, we need to figure out why. And then compliance is a huge important factor, especially if you have an excellent therapist like we do here, um, they really can improve the outcome. So people who are compliant will have better outcomes with their wounds. Other things impair healing, aging, malnutrition, infection, diabetes, impaired oxygenation, other diseases, steroids, radiation. We have big problems with diabetes. So we published a paper with 68 patients who just burned their feet and there's a high amputation rate with diabetics. So the goal for partial thickness wounds is to get the bottom cell layer, the basal cell layer to migrate across that wound better. And same thing from the hair follicles. Um, so it's been shown from multiple studies, a moist wound allows healing to be more rapid and uh, allows for better healing and chances for reducing scar formation. So your goal is to optimize reepithelialization, maintain that moist environment. And if it's after two weeks, then you may consider skin grafts. Now, the best thing we have now are the biologic dressings. When I was started, burns, we would often uh, have them wash the wounds twice a day, put on vasotracin and a dressing and do it twice a day. It was really tough. Now, people come in, you wash it off, apply a biologic dressing, it sticks for a week or so, you come back, you peel it off, they're healed, they don't have to be admitted. Um, BioBrain was the first one. There's a new version of Permiderm coming out, I hear. You could use pigskin, although pigskin's now not available. You could go to Allograft. We use Mepilax AG, there's Aquacel, there's all different kinds of dressings that you put on, you leave them for a week, you have them come back to clinic, and then they look pretty good. Or if you really Fancy, you can buy a skin substitute that releases growth factors. So you heal a whole half day faster, but since they cost about two to 3,000 for a tiny piece, people don't use them. Well, another factor is pigmentation. Melanocytes are interesting cells. They come from the neural crust cells. They're, so they're like nerve cells and they migrate to the basement membrane and sit there with the basal cells and they send out dendrites to multiple keratinocytes they make melanin, they package it melanosome, and they deliver out through these dendrites to all the keratinocytes who actually phagocytize the melanosomes and put the pigment above, above their uh, nucleus to protect themselves from the sun. Now there's two kinds of melanocytes, those that give you skin color and those that give you hair color. Well, so we have different colors. Well, when you heal a burn, this is a donor site, but you re first. Later on, you get the uh, brown dots as the melanocytes, either they convert from a hair melanocyte to a skin melanocyte, or we're not sure what happens, but later on, you get the brown dots, the hair follicles, they spread out, and you re-pigment the area. Now, we're not very good with pigmentation. Sometimes it's darker, sometimes it's lighter, depending on how fast you heal. And we don't have really good ways to match it. So that's another area of research that we could work on to try to get better skin matching. Hydroquinone will lighten a, a pigmentation, but uh, you can't really control it. Now we know when you get to larger burns, you get to, or deeper burns, you need skin grafts. And split thickness very simply through the dermis. And then full thickness is all the way through down the fat. Now, some of the principles of skin grafting, thicker grafts contract less. Use the thicker grafts in important areas like the hands and face, thinner areas and less important areas. But you also remember the thicker the donor site, the more the potential for scarring. So you have to match those two out. Some of my colleagues feel you have to allograft before you can autograph, but I graft on fat all the time. And we'll talk about sheet grafts versus mesh grafts. It's just a picture on the left where uh, full thickness skin graft is better than a split thickness, so thicker does better. And we do a lot of outpatient grafts. We have a lot of palm, palm wounds. We just published that we, uh, we average about 68 contact burns in toddlers every year, and many of these kids we have to graft. So we do them as outpatients. They grab a curling iron, and you could do a full thickness skin graft. It's the same day surgery, it's obviously different and they can do real well. You do a donor site at the groin, they can be very cosmetically appealing. You can't see them unless you're a stripper. 
Now people have to remember that there is no pigmentation in the palm, so the alternative is to take the sole of the foot, which is not a really good place to harvest skin. Then early excision now is a philosophy. It's uh, something that most people are now following. Dr. Herden showed if you do an earlier excision that you have uh, less blood loss. Um, in theory, you cover the wound with something, you slow down that inflammatory response and reduce the length of stay. And how early is early? Well, we will take a massive burn within the next day or so. Small burns, if they're clearly third degree, Next time there's available OR time, we'll just excise and graft it. Now, obviously, you have to excise deep enough. You, in the old days, when I was a fellow, we did it down to bleeding, but now we use tourniquets for most of it. So you must know what the viable fat looks like if you graft on fat. And if you're going to do sheet skin grafts, you got to get rid of all the dermis, or else you get the inclusion cysts. Dr. Engrav used to say the dreaded sponge skin. If you leave any dermal remnants, you'll get inclusion cysts. Now, the other thing that's new, this is a little older picture, but the wider the dermatome, the less seams you have and seams are scars, so you can get it, cover a lot more of the wound. When you harvest, you can use epinephrine to reduce bleeding, most people do that, but also think about the site. Where are you gonna take it from? You, you don't wanna take a, a donor from an upper back and a young woman because that's, if she wants to wear a dress that shows her upper back, you'll have a donor site there. And color match is important, I'll talk about later. So if you harvest a donor site from a thigh, you go down the thigh and you have this kind of a scar, well, you won't wear shorts again. Pigment's still a problem we talked about, but what I do for a lot of my uh, thigh donor sites, I do them in a circumferential fashion up high. So if there is some scarring, the shorts cover it. The back is a really good place to harvest skin, especially in children where you can roll them easier. It's not as easy in the 300 pounder. Um, but down around the shorts area, the scarring is less. And we actually have good results with backs, and mainly because the back has thicker skin. Now, sheet grass, what I mean is whole sheets of skin, not full thickness, but a whole sheet of skin instead of mesh. Mesh skin is easier to use, but in the long run, it has a less appealing cosmetic appearance. So this child on the left, well, he's got a good graft, but he hates it because it's got that mesh pattern that lasts for life and you can have a nice sheet graft and it's a lot harder to see. Now, this just shows you that what the surgeons do is about five to 10% of the work because the therapists and the other parts are what really play important roles. So here's a classic skull burn and showing the time course, it looks great on day five, but what he looks like on six weeks, dry, itchy every day, the axilla is shrinking, he has to be stretched. At three to four months, it's thicker. This is three months, thicker, redder. So you need to really keep up with the process, keep the therapy going. And it doesn't start fading to six months and then at a year it can look okay. So that's a long course of therapists and nurses everyone's really plays a huge role in the ult ultimate outcome. Now the seams are an important issue. Um, a straight line creates tension through TGF beta signaling and that creates more of a scar. So we came up with an idea back and published it in 93, I think, 94, that if you break up the seam and make it so it's zigzag, you don't have as much scarring. So on the top of this foot, not as much far scarring when you have a, a zigzag pattern. Or in this hand, here it's nice and flat because there's no tension, but here a straight scar has more tension and more scarring. And so you can take one big piece, this young lady had a third degree burn to her upper chest and arm. I took one big six inch wide piece from her back onto her thigh and no seams and it's turned out pretty well. And just to show some examples, we try to cover this hand. Um, this is a bilateral third degree burns. Um, cover the hand with one six inch piece, made the seams on the volar surface. Now she'll have pigmentation problems on the Palmer side, but you can see now 10 years later, it still looks quite good. Um, she's very happy with the results. To get rid of that pigmentation would require regrafting and 
I wouldn't do it. Now, principles of the face, we do a lot of face grafting. There are pigmentation issues. Skin above the clavicle is a different color than skin from below. And don't forget the aesthetic units. The aesthetic units, the forehead is a unit, the cheek is a unit, the chin is a unit. Now, plastic surgeons don't make incisions in the middle of the forehead or in the middle of a the cheek. They make it at the hairline or they make it at uh, the nasolabial fold. They try to hide areas so you don't see where the incision is. Now, skin graft should, be, should follow that same principle. You shouldn't have a seam if you can in the middle of the forehead or in the middle of the cheek to try to put the seams at these lines to try to hide them. So this is an example of a young woman who had a thigh donor from her for her face and you can see an obvious color difference. She hates this. If she had taken it from the scalp, it would be better color match. Skin from the scalp is, matches the face better than skin from the thigh. Now I came up with an idea several years ago, but the idea is if you're gonna take skin for a face, well, why not try to match the donor site shape to the face instead of a whole straight line, make a U shape. So this is a big guy, big U shape here, big U shape there to try to cover his face. So you don't have to worry about the seams. Um, you can have a seam at the nose, which is appropriate, but try to eliminate the seams. Now, it's not perfect, uh, pigmentation will come back, but I'll give you examples of others. Now, obviously you have to have uh, donor site avail availability and when you have a whole face, the color match from below doesn't really matter because you don't see the contrast. So you can take a nice U-shaped skin. This is the first one I did and wrapped it around and it can turn out pretty well. Another example, this actually was a child when Dr. Heimbach visited us. He said, I'll oh, save the skin for the face whose integra on his trunk. And so I sheet crafted his face on the, and it turned out pretty well. Um, he's grown up with it. He even sends me high school pictures, um, so you can make face graphs look pretty good. Another child, here's the color match isn't perfect, but she didn't have enough skin from her scalp for a donor. But you know, we'll do tissue expanders, to try to expand the hair and try to cover that area. But again, putting nice big sheet graphs on the face will end up with a better result. Avoidance seams is very helpful. Now, we show our good pictures, but they're not all that easy. Um, when there's severe destruction, you gotta do the best with what you have left. Sometimes I feel like I'm all the king's soldiers and horses that try to put Humpty Dumpty back together again, because sometimes you don't have all the pieces. So you, you do the best you can. So I'll give you examples of not perfect face graphs. So this is a guy who worked for Agilent Technology and had uh, sodium, basically an explosion in his face um, from, from an explosion, he lost his eye, he still put a whole big sheet on his face. Um, this was from white phosphorus, believe it or not, um, something we used to see in the military. Or you get these challenges. Um, I've had three patients who've lost their hard palate. Um, this guy actually had advanced necrotic cutaneous lucios phenomenon from leprosy, hard to believe. Um, he lost his arms, his legs, and basically that was his face, all necrotic, including his anterior two-thirds of his hard palate, his nose. We consulted with ENT, and ENT said, well, just let him die. Well, the guy was awake, alert, and said, I don't want to die. So you try to put sheets on him, cover him the best you can, and he's happy to be alive, but you do the best you can. Here's another extreme, a young woman who was burning the extensions of her hair. It caught fire. She was unable to put it out. She ran around and screamed. This is the kind of stuff you get sometimes, horribly deep burns. Now we took her and excised what we could, allografted it at first, but good areas exposed bone. Burned was down to like her mid chest, so we had no flaps. So we had to burr the outer table of her skull to try to get granulation tissue. She burned her eyelid off on the left side. We tried to protect it and she ended up losing her eye. This is the allograph later on. We eventually used Integra um, and we were able to graft her. Again, trying to get one big, big sheets of grafts, but clearly you can't make everyone look as good as the previous ones. Just 
because what you're starting with is a big mess and you do your best with what you can. The nice thing about working at Shriner is you get these horrible scar contractures and you can really help these kids out. Now this young girl from the Philippines was sent to us. She proves the fact that if you wait long enough, all burns heal. She had a skull burn to her chest and abdomen and this is 16 months after the skull burn she was sent to us and she'd almost healed her wounds and it's pretty amazing you see this stuff. The nice thing is you can always be the hero because you can make them better. I just took all the scar off and resurfaced her with skin graft. She had plenty of donor site. The one on the right is, well, she's in back in the Philippines here. She came back, I did some minor stuff and she's much happier. I won't be perfect, but certainly better than she was when she arrived. And as I said, we do massive burns. We have a lot of massive burns right now. And so the principles of massive burn coverage you want to remove the burn quickly. Within one to two weeks, I say, we actually do it quicker now. Um, and cover the wounds with a skin to slow down that upper metabolic response if you can. And this is what you do for the big burns in the old days. Um, this is the burn diagram. We would start with the hands because they're more functional. We excise the hands and cover it with a smaller mesh. And then go wider mesh in the arms. When you run out of skin, you use allograft. That's what we did. And back in Cincinnati, we actually had fresh allograft, so it was a real transplant and it wasn't rejected because really, um, your soybean is pressed, you can keep the skin on. And, and that process basically slowed down that inflammatory response. And then as the donor sites heal, you replace it, keep replacing it. And here you can see on the back looks kind of lousy, but the allograft had been on for two months, we replaced it. And here we are 64 days we covered this child with the old-fashioned way keep on going back and reharvesting. now during this whole process you have to fight sepsis and infections and do your best but they can turn out okay well what are some of the new things we have we're just starting to look at resell i haven't really used it too much but the idea behind spray cells is that you take a thin autograft, you separate the uh, epidermis from the dermis with an enzyme. You actually macerate the epithelial cells and you spray them on the wounds. Now, I was part of the one study that tried to put it on deep, deep second degree burns. And it, in my eye, it didn't work that well for third degree burns. It doesn't replace skin grafts, but it is good for trying to heal donor sites if you have leftover donor site um, skin and to fill in the interstices and I took these pictures from the uh, case studies actually studied from Jimmy Holmes but wide mesh and he sprayed it and it could fill in the interstices faster which is a good strategy because that's the area that slows down the healing so if you can fill in with a cell that'd be a great strategy now it does require an extra donor site but with the massive burns you're trying to use every donor you can. So it may not work in that way, unless you have a way to take any kind of small leftovers and spray it on. And we haven't gone that way yet. But we know skin substitutes are out there. They've been out there since 1981. Um, I don't believe they're useful if you have good donor sites. So I wouldn't wait on an area if you have a good donor site and just autograph them right away. But if you don't, it's a good strategy. Now I stole this slide from Dr. Boyce, but I love it. And where I'm not at the stage yet, you go to the store and you grab a skin off the shelf and you put it on the patient. Um, although you can get allogeneic skin, um, it just doesn't stay. So the first thing that was ever used was cultured epithelial autographed. Um, back in the original days, um, they didn't use a dermis. Um, they would excise down to the fascia, the fascial excisions because of better blood supply. And they did have significant scarring. This is a kid took care of years and years ago, but he's got thin legs and a bulbous knee because he had fat there and he's lost, he's got stick-like legs. He's not crazy about him. And then there's a fair amount of shear with the cultured epithelial autograph, so it doesn't have durability. And so we're using it a little differently now, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but we do use a six to one mesh underneath it. Well, Dr. Heimbach really was the one who pushed Integra. He came to us years ago and said, that's really, it really made the difference. 
And I know people in Harborview, they're the Integra experts. I've not been quite as good at its use, but the idea is a good sound one. And first of all, it's made of collagen and that's covered with a silicone surface. And the silicone really does slow down the inflammatory response to a great extent. It basically slows that process down and then it needs three to four weeks to vascularize. Um, we're not able to put culture up for the autograph on it, so you have to do a thin autograph and put it on it. Now, Dr. Heimbach used to go around and said it eliminated scarring. So here's an example. Um, the black stuff is an Actacode, a silver looting dressing, where that's Integra, the plastic looking material, and a mash. And you can see, well, maybe it did scar. Nothing gets rid of scarring, unfortunately, but uh, um, it still is a good option. I have more problems with infection, so we've tried other things too. Now, lately we've been using a new product called Biodegradable Temporizing Matrix, which is a really difficult name, so everyone calls it BTM. It's a Polynovo product, and we tried using it um, part of a trial, and so since then we've liked it. And it's very interesting. It's a polyurethane foam with a polyurethane membrane on top. Now, polyurethane is the same stuff as Tegaderm. It's a plastic. And what we have found is that it seems to reduce infection risk. So you can get some infections, but it seems to be more resistant to infections than um, Integra and lousy Allograft. So we've used it fairly successfully. Here's an example of a child with 90% burns. And uh, again, our philosophy is to get rid of all the burns early on. So we use the BTM on this child. You see on the left what it first looks like. It looks like a foam. It's like, how could this stuff work? And here we are two days. It already looks better. And we weren't able to get to it till 73 days later. And this is what it looks like if it looks good. It's pink. You push on it, it blanches. Here we peeled the outer membrane off. We applied grass as good as we can. It's hard with 90 percent We tried to eliminating seams as best we could, and here he is. It turned out pretty well and survived his 90% burns. So what do we do now? Um, they come in, we resuscitate them. The next day, we'll actually take them to the OR. Uh, we have a team of people that goes in, two, three, even four attendings, one or two fellows, residents, medical students. Everyone grabs an extremity, everyone grabs something and starts working on the patient. We usually do the anterior trunk, arms, legs, hands. If we have skin available, we'll start with the hands and graft them. Maybe go to the feet if we have some available. Then we'll go to BTM. If the wound bed doesn't look quite good, we'll start with allograft, come back and put the BTM on. And you get a biopsy for the cultured epithelial autograft very early um, because we'll probably use it in the future. Um, second day, we usually do the back. Um, we wait on the back because it's too hard when you have an adult who's 300 pounds to do that all at once. Um, we can usually do a day one excision in about three to four hours. And then the next day, BTM to the back. And then the faces I usually do separate because they're a little more work. They bleed a lot more. And so you can focus on really doing a better job on the face. Then we reharvest the four to one when it's available. But, you know, we talked to John Greenwood who really invented the BTM and he said, what about putting CEA on the BTM? He said, it won't work. You don't have the, you don't have the adhesion molecules, the collagen type seven there. But, well, we said, what the heck? We have no option. This is that same 90% burn. So we actually did. We did the six to one mesh and then we covered with the CEA. And you can see on the left, this is what it turned out. Now clearly it, has scarring. He actually had abdominal compartment syndrome, but we were able to cover him with the CEA. The CEA helped close him faster. And I'll just finish up with, uh, it's kind of a sad thing, but Dr. Boyce developed a superb skin that's been held up by the FDA. And now it's approved by the FDA, but we don't have a sponsor to manage it. But what he came up with the idea is that, hey, you can grow fibroblasts from the patient's own skin. So you do a biopsy of their own skin, grow fibroblasts, put them in a collagen matrix. He played with endothelial cells and melanocytes, but these studies don't show it. And then you grow keratinocytes and skin should be a dermis for strength and an epidermis for a barrier function. So we do that. 
So the example I show you, this is a kid who was attacked by a Molotov cocktail and a gang thing. This is his donor site. He's African American. That's his donor site. He's got a little on his head and a little bit on his feet. That's all he had to deal with. So we, same process. This is about 15 years ago, maybe 18 years ago now. We covered his trunk with Integra. We autographed his hands, a little bit on his arms. We harvested his donor site. We put uh, allograft near the trach and in the groin because allograft resists infection more than skin substitutes because it's the fencins, cephalocytins, and other proteins. Covered his face with Integra back then. And here it is. This was grown in the lab, took about four weeks. We still four to one mesh when we had donor site. And it looks okay, but here you can see it covered this child. Big problem was pigmentation. So Dr. Boyce has been working with adding melanocytes. The FDA is not crazy about it because of risk of melanoma. That's his donor site, but pigmentation was a huge problem. But here's four to one mesh has big bent. The skin substitute doesn't. We all graft his face and he survived. So that's my talk. And I just to finish up by saying, why do I do burns? And just have to mention, I was very lucky. Uh, I was called by Baiba Gruby. I'm not sure if anyone remembers her, but she was an attending with Dr. Heimbach, did a fellowship a couple of years before me. He called me up and said, hey, Dave, why don't you do the burn fellowship? And I said, well, I don't know. I didn't have a job, so I'll go look at it. And I did. And um, I have to say it's a very rewarding career. And I'll tell you, this is why, why I do burns. This kind of stuff we get. This is an electrical burn from a kid from Mexico. And you excise, gets pretty deep. He burned his arms, legs. And you wonder, is it worth surviving like this? So I've taken care of about 18 to maybe 20 quad amps, and they've all been happy to be alive. This kid has graduated from the program, very happy. And you know, as you get older, you get to follow your kids. This is the first electrical burn I had to take care of in 1997. Um, he lost his arms, you wonder how he does. Here we are about two years ago, I saw him. He's in his 30s, very happy. He's got kids, he's working, he's in Mexico. Give me his thanks. So you get to see people grow up and be happy with what happens to them. Well, not happy, with, but happy to be alive and functioning. This young girl in the center, that's her mom. First big burn at Shriners. Here she was when she graduated. And both these two, Erica and Stephanie, same car fire when we were horribly deep burns. Erica now works for the one of the camp burn camps and she's an artist, so they're happy to be alive. And so it's good to see it. This is that girl with the horrible face burn when she left. She's doing okay, um, coming around. That's the 90% burn. He's very happy to be alive. So it's been a worthwhile career and it was a Great uh, opportunity to talk to you about uh, my program, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Greenhall. I just want to open it to the audience if they have any questions. Well, maybe I'll start. Um, you talked about, uh, you started your talk about the wildfires and being a uh, big problem in California. Um, and it just made me think about how advances in uh, healthcare are caused by uh, a, lot, a lot of times um, uh, in the situations we put in, you know, so the, you know, we have a pandemic now. And so we have a, a maybe a vaccine that was going to be developed in less than one year. We've had wars. And so that's how we made a lot of advances in trauma. What do you think the wildfires are going to do for us in the burn community? One thing it's going to do is uh, really teach people how to manage big burns. It's like uh, it's people back east say they don't see big burns and you go to do verifications. Uh, they don't get that experience. Um, but it certainly gives an opportunity to try new products. So the development of things like BTM, Integra, um, where they really play a role in the massive burns and the, the testing of skin substitutes and uh, 
that's the areas that you really need them right, in improving the use of culture depth of the autograph, which has also helped us out. So I think a lot of it is now you can test how do you treat and cover these big burns because if it's just a hand burn, you just graft them. So I think that's one area. Um, we're learning about how do you really prevent these fires? It's very difficult in California. We're not as fortunate with you guys where you get rain. We have no precipitation for seven, eight, nine months. Um, and so maybe we'll also point out the fact that global warming is more of a problem as people areas get more arid. Maybe we can try to develop strategies to try to uh, improve our prevention strategies for areas that remain dry for long periods. Um, consider improving our electrical. Uh, a lot of the big problems here are due to high power lines. Um, so there's uh, a lot we can do. And the other problem is that we need to think about, for instance, in my neighborhood up in the mountains, I have a house. How do you reduce the risks? People uh, in our area, they actually cleared out two miles around the whole neighborhood of central, the big wood. So you a third of the forest has been eliminated to try to reduce the fires. So the strategies for decreasing the risks have been really learned and seem to be effective. Um, but I'll tell you, it's, it's a scary thing. Our next question is from Dr. Ababi. Sam? Uh, Dr. Greenhall, thank you again for coming. It, it was a fantastic talk. Uh, I have actually three questions related though. For hand grafts, your opinion regarding web grafting, uh, do you leave that area open or, and over the joints, especially the wrinkled uh, PI, uh, PI joints, what do you do? Uh, do you leave them or do you excise and sheet graft them? That's regarding the hand. And then seam or not to seam. Uh, you, uh, seam area scars, but people have been telling um, have been discussing like if you have a big sheet graft over the neck, that you should put seams at correct locations. That makes it better. So even when you have a sheet graft that is large, create those seams for better function. What is your opinion? Thank you. Well, Sam, I, um, I, I excise the knuckles along with everywhere else and I don't put seams in the hands. You saw that young girl um, that I, did the African-American girl, I like to eliminate them as much as possible. And if you're gonna to have to have a seam, think about it where you put it to reduce the scarring and try to break it up if you can. So my goal and our goal for our fellowship is to try to teach the fellows to eliminate the seams altogether on the hand. I thought about whether you try to wrinkle the graft a little bit at the knuckles, but what I do is when I, if I just do a dorsal hand, I will position that hand in inflection so that it's stretched out. And I can tell you the one great thing I have is I have superb hand therapists here at the Shrine, which makes a huge difference. Now, I also have had uh, babies with fall into the fires and have palm burns and or the entire hand burned. So those are even more challenging, but the therapy is what made the huge difference. As far as necks are concerned, I've done a bunch of big necks. I've done neck, big neck releases. I will still use one whole sheet. I don't put a seam anywhere. I will do that six inch wide and the six inch wide is good from the chin to the clavicle for a lot of people. Um, and I will try to put it at the t basically the top of the burn right at the chin and go all the way down as far as I can. Then if I have a seam at the top of the clavicle area, then I will uh, try to break that up um, and put another sheet at the upper chest. So a lot of times we get those burns with shirts catch fire. So big sheet at the top and another sheet at the cross above the, the nipples. And if I have enough skin, I'll go down another sheet and cover uh, the whole chest. When I do women with breasts, I take a sheet graft and actually kind of wrap around the breasts. So, and put the seam underneath, kind of like uh, you would make an incision for uh, breast augmentation, and that's worked pretty well. So 
I think about how I position the seams, but I, um, I really, um, really try to minimize the seams. The more you have, the more problems. Now, obviously, if it's a drug addict, uh, elderly, very deep burn in the lower leg, I don't really I mesh those. So it's a pretty easy to do. But uh, um, most of the time, especially with some do a lot of children, I try to sheet wrap them as much as possible. Thank you very much. Platysma excise or uh, leave it be? Um, if the platysma, if I don't need to go that deep, I won't go that deep. Um, but when I do neck releases, which I do a fair amount of, I will go right through it. Um, and uh, I have on occasion used a dermal substitute like Integra, but I found that if you do a nice sheet graft and have good positioning, um, just a nice big thick sheet graft works great on the neck. Dr. Jabbar, you have a comment about this last discussion? No, I have a comment about the forest fire issues. Um, several years ago at our Whammy Trauma Conference, uh, Eileen Bulger had the good sense to invite a expert in uh, forest fires. There's actually an entire um, specialty related to uh, geography of forest fires. It was probably one of the most illuminating talks that I've been to in many years. <clears throat> and the reality is one of the problems that our country has is facing is uh, inadequate burning of our forests. And so uh, fire suppression of our forests is a failed policy. And we need to think of ways to allow the fire fo forests to burn uh, for their own health and find ways to avoid uh, spread of those fires to um, population populated areas. But um, it, it was um, really quite a uh, eye-opening presentation. We probably are in the order of multi-million acres of forests that should have burned over the last 150 years that have not. Yeah, Nicole, I certainly have heard that and California is doing its best to burn its forests lately. But, uh, um, and I also visited the Redwoods not too long ago where they showed the old growth forests where they were really huge redwoods and things that they don't allow the underbrush, the small trees to grow um, and uh, they're more successful when they've logged areas and just allowed it to grow wild. That's, those are the ones that need to burn as you talk about. Um, and it, it's difficult, as you know, our population in California is pretty high and people are moving all over the state and it tends to be smaller communities way up in the mountains in the woods that are a problem. But I've learned by buying a house up in the Sierra that um, if you take your house and let the saplings grow, you have all these little tiny little trees that are there and they drop needles everywhere. But if you can clear out those areas and just leave the large trees, they don't, the fires don't travel as fast and you can control it to some extent. Um, I agree that uh, probably for millions and millions of years, the forest will burn and come back. Because if you go in the redwoods, there's areas that these redwoods tolerate the fires, they're charred, but they have, they keep growing. And um, it's a hard thing to do when there's communities in the area. And like in Santa Rosa, which is not too far away from, uh, basically it's in near Napa Valley. Um, it, that's a community and part of the problem in California, not only is the forests, but the grasslands, you know, there was an Oakland fire 25 years ago that burned down parts of Oakland and the LA areas where there you see those hills that are just all grass and oak trees, winds and flames go right up those areas. So part of it's just the drying. If we had more rain, we'd be better off. But it's, I agree that it's just hard to, and we certainly do have a lot of fires, 4% of the California burned last year. So there, I guess nature's taking its course.
Uh, Dave, I'm not sure you're able to see the chat, but there's a, a nice set of questions from Dr. Mogal. Um, one is about compassion, compassion fatigue. You showed us a number of big burns and how they managed to survive. Uh, the second question is about how you translate some of what you were able to accomplish into the a resource uh, limited uh, world. Um, yeah, a lot of these kids, a lot of people have survived. As far as the ones from the summer, we're about uh, 50, 60 percent alive still. Um, not everyone does, but we're doing pretty well. These are one of them is a child. The rest of them are all adults. Um, well, how I translate this into the world is all right. Uh, I wrote a paper about the man who face burns this year. It's in burns and trauma. Dr. Paul Mary forced me to write a paper, but it's published. I try to write. I published a book on uh, management of burns, um, and we look at our outcomes. We just published uh, results of uh, contact burns to the hands and how we deal with them. We also are about to submit a paper on our experience with face burns. Um, so basically, how to get this out to the world, we, we write papers. and continue to write papers about what we do. We study our results. Uh, we're working on putting together our BTM experience and publish that. Um, what I don't do is I try not to get paid by the companies to sell products. I, I refuse to do that, but I will write papers about our experience with whatever we're using, if it works, if it doesn't work. Um, I, I, I'm a more of a fan of taking your data and writing it objectively without any support. And, uh, um, but that's what I do. I so said the next question, and maybe we'll have to make this the last question is uh, from Dr. Kim about, uh, it's also in the chat about macrophage and fibroblast in profile in the wounds that you described to us. Well, one of my goals I've always wanted to do is look at uh, the mechanism of scarring and own Nicole has for years too, Dr. Tredgett has, and I've put grants together that haven't been funded yet, but I would love maybe you younger people at some point in the future. I think the question that needs to be asked is what is the signaling that happens around 10 days and around 18 days and look at the difference in cell signaling that goes on there. Um, and I've got some good ideas. Nicole and I would love to have a chat sometime about and maybe your talks later on, we'll talk about it. But uh, what are the factors that change at around two weeks that lead to hypertrophic scarring? Because most of the studies with scar formation are, they take place at uh, a year, two years, you got a hypertrophic scar and your normal skin, you say, all right, what's the difference between the two cell types? Well, that's like taking a rusty car in a car accident and comparing a new car to a rusty car that's been a car accident two years ago. You need to know what happened when the change occurred. So, and I've uh, submitted several grants to look at that and I haven't been funded as of yet, but maybe someday I will as I get older or maybe someone else will want to do it with us. And I, I would love to see the ABA uh, get together a scar management group that would uh, develop a multi-center trial to look at cell signaling macrophages, fibroblast signaling at the early time points. And maybe when you're president, Tom, you can put that task force together. To conclude, I just want to say thank you for uh, being our, our visiting professor. We are not able to host you properly this year. We do have what we call the younger people call the merch um, uh, that we will um, mail to you. Uh, this is the, the plaque. Uh, that was instituted by uh, Dr. Gibran, and there's only two ways you can get it. Uh, you can get it by uh, spending a year here as a clinical fellow, uh, or you can be a visiting professor, and I think you've done both, so you really earned this. Um, and what we have that special this year is we also made bone center mask, and so we definitely will mail this to you, uh, because that's, um, uh, that I think will probably be good for another six months, and hopefully people won't burn their mask afterwards. Um, and for those who are able to join, uh, we have a, a separate uh, meeting at eight uh, with a different Zoom number uh, where, where we feature seven of our uh, trainees and we hope that Dr. Greenhall will be able to uh, uh, give us some insight on, on the ongoing research. So thank you very much uh, and thank you for letting us have, have this morning.
Thank you, Tom. Dr. Wood, any, uh, anything else? No, this is an uh, inspiring talk. Uh, it reminds me of uh, all my days working with John Burke in Boston. Uh, and uh, I said some sudden flashbacks of uh, my own burn experience, which is now very remote. And so it's great to see all the advances and the incredible work that you and the other uh, burn specialists are doing. I know uh, Dr. Gibran, Dr. Pham, uh, uh, Dr. Stewart, uh, Dr. Mandel here, and Dr. Greenhall, your, your team at uh, UC doing wonderful work. Thank you. And thank you for being here. Thank you.